Okay, so we were uh, discussing mostly uh, kind of revising uh, your concepts on control systems and revising in such a way that we can use it directly for uh, for our purposes, right? So we saw that loop gain has all the information. So now the next thing is to uh, go about uh, figuring out how to calculate loop gain or how to design circuits using using these concepts, right? So the main uh, the main takeaway from whatever we have uh, done till now is in a loop gain, the desirable loop gain plot should look something like this. I mean, should ideally look something like this first order. But if you have additional poles, the additional pole should come after the gain crossover frequency or the UGP. It should not come before. So the key takeaways are the poles should be far apart. So for a for a system to have a clean now clean is a relative term, but you understand clean by something which is not overshooting or undershooting by by a uh, by a lot, right? For the system to have a clean step response. Poles so poles of L of S, right? Poles of L of S. Now, in a system, I say closed loop system. Poles of L of S must be far apart. So that is one. And obviously, the other thing is to for the system to finally settle accurately, the DC gain should be large enough, that is much more than zero dB, okay? So now then the naturally the question arises as to how to go about uh, uh, figuring out poles in our in our system. So if we, we limit ourselves to first order poles, I mean, we'll limit ourselves to real poles, not first order poles, we limit ourselves to real poles in, in our discussion. And let's start off with a, a simple RC circuit. So let's say I have a R and a C. And I might be applying, so let's say I say, uh, something like this, okay? So what is the pole associated with, with this system? Firstly, order is one, so you should have one pole. If it's a single order system, real system, you can only have real poles. You cannot have imaginary complex poles. So what is the pole associated with this? One over RC, right? Or if I have to be very precise, it's negative of one over RC. So now, how do we figure out what this is a pole? I mean, we can obviously write out the full equation, but uh, we also know that this is equal to minus one over tau, the time constant of the system. The time constant of the system, when you pass the case, translates to translates to a pole. So now, what we have to do is, in our uh, circuits, we have to figure out the time constant, if possible, uh, looking into various nodes. Okay. So if each node has a capacitance, all we have to do then is to figure out what is the resistance associated with it. If I know the capacitance, I know the resistance, then I know the time constant. If I know the time constant, I know the pole. Right? That's all, right? So, um, so that's what we are going to do. Yeah, yeah, we will have, you can have multiple poles. So we will talk about that also, right? So let's start off with what happens if you have, uh, if you have one pole associated with one node. Okay, so uh, now if I invoke, if I invoke this observation that the poles can be far apart, have to be far, far apart. So then what I am essentially looking for is in a system that probably has like five, six, seven poles. If a system has to be stable, or rather if we have to design a system that is stable, then only one of the poles would be low frequency and the, all the other poles will be above UGB, right? Above omega U. The other way of thinking about it is, if we have to critically analyze the stability of a system, we need to look for the low frequency poles first, and then see if they are near the UGB or away from the UGB and so on, right? If we first go ahead and analyze, if we first go ahead and find the low frequency poles in a system, 
and we find that they are sufficiently far apart, right? When I say far apart, I mean they are not on the same side of the UGB, right? Then we can, to some extent, conclude that the system is probably going to be well behaved, okay? So the reason I'm saying all these things is you might have five, six, seven, eight poles in a system because each node is associated with the capacitance, each node is associated with the resistance, which means you should be able to evaluate the system, uh, uh, it is, which means a system which, which is out of the order of, let's say, seven, eight, nine, I don't know. So can also have seven, eight, nine poles. Okay, but not all poles will be of our interest. The poles that will be of our interest are the poles which are the lowest frequency poles among those, among those seven, eight, nine poles. Okay, so now how do I, how do I go about figuring out which is the low frequency pole? Under the assumption that all the capacitance are of the similar values, which is something that we can assume because all of them are made of transistors having more or less similar sizes. One transistor is not like thousand times but larger than another. So if we make that assumption, then if the capacitance are of similar values, then the thing that we have to look out for is the resistance. So a circuit can have, sorry, a circuit can have different resistances at different nodes. So essentially, if I have to look out for the low frequency nodes, what I'm looking for is the nodes which have high resistances, right? So high resistance nodes can contribute to low frequency poles under the assumption that the capacitance are of similar values, right? So we'll be looking out for the high resist, highly resistive nodes and the poles associated with those nodes, okay? So, so essentially the takeaway is look out for High resistance. Okay, so let's now with with this uh, with this lens, let's look at our differential amplifier. So here we essentially have, other than the, if I disregard the input, by the way, when I'm finding out the poles, what are you doing with the inputs? In a normal RC network, first order RC, what do we do to the input? We are essentially trying to figure out the time constant, right? So when you do try to figure out the time constant, what do we do to the input? I want the time constant of, associated with the capacitor. Right? I know it's first order is RC, but it's if it's not a simple RC, it has a bunch of R's and everything connected together. And in order to figure out the time constant, I need to figure out the equivalent resistance. So in order to find out the equivalent resistance, what should I do to the input? Short it, right? So if it's uh, desensitize it, it's a voltage source, short it, current source, open it. Okay. So similarly, in a differential amplifier, I'll have inputs connected to both sides. So that I can short incrementally. Again, incrementally, this is not required. This is open, this is not short. So I have to then find out the poles and the, I have to find out the uh, resistance associated with each of these nodes, because we know that there are capacitances here, there are capacitance here, there is capacitance here, right? So one might argue that you might get a different result for finding the poles, if I do it, if I put all the circuit together and find out the transfer function, or if I find out the poles as find out the resistance associated with each of these nodes, and then multiply, then find out the time constant and associate the poles, right? So what I essentially mean will be clear when I when I finish this argument. So for the time being, what I want to do is to find out the resistance associated with each of these nodes. Let's say I call this node one, node two, node three. So approximately, what is the resistance looking into here? I call this M1, M2, M3, M4. And you assume that GM times RO is much greater than one for all transistors. So what is the resistance looking into one? Great. So this resistance is RD4. 
this is RO1. RO1 is RD this RDS4 parallel RDS2. What about resistance looking into three? Here. So it will be the resistance looking down is the same as two R not one, right? Because if I look the um, if I try to figure out the resistance looking down into M2, whatever I'll get, I'll get something similar looking down into M1, right? Of the same order at least. So what about resistance looking up? That is a diode connected transistor. Source is shorted. Approximately one over GM, right? So now you have essentially one over GM in parallel with a large resistance. So effectively, the resistance looking into that node, that is RO3, becomes one over GM3, approximately. What about looking into node 2, RO2? Approximately again. So there are two, it's a parallel combination of two cases, right? So this, let's do this. What is the resistance looking into the source of M1 given that you have a dial connected load connected at the source, uh, at the drain side? Use the table. So 1 over GM1 plus, yeah, that load resistance 1 over GM divided by the intrinsic gain of M1. I mean, the second term essentially is much smaller than the first term. So essentially it's one over GM of the order of one over GM. I don't even have to look into source of M2 because I have a dominant resistor already. So this becomes the dominant resistance, right? So naturally the, that becomes a low frequency pole. And the capacitance associated with that output will contribute to the lowest frequency pole. So for the purpose of this course, we'll make the approximation that all the high frequency poles we are going to neglect and we'll only find out the low frequency pole and see its effect okay so essentially then the pole associated with this so p1 becomes minus whatever if i have a capacitance associated here let's say call it c1 so this will become 1 over ro1 times c1 where ro1 is rds4 parallel rds2 Okay. Any questions till now? So if you are really rigorously mathematical enough, then you should you should ask me that is it the same as finding out time constants for each node and find out the associated poles, or I find out the brute force transfer function taking all capacitances into account. Will I get the same values of poles, the same location of the poles? We are not going to get the same location of the poles. What I, what I have done is an approximation. In that approximation, I have essentially made an inherent assumption that finding out the look, uh, finding out the location of the one of the poles is independent of the location of the other poles. Right? That's an inherent assumption that I have made without really speaking, without explicitly making it clear. What I'm essentially saying is that I make an assumption that when I'm finding out P1, I'm neglecting the capacitances associated with 3 and 2. Right? That's why it becomes a first order system. And that's why in a first order system, I can associate a time constant. But that need not necessarily be the case. But in these cases, it, we can make that approximation. Well, whatever happens, you might get some error, but the error can be negligible because we already have a dominant term. Because we have a dominant term, we'll be able to Get rid of this. Yeah, use this approximation. Had all these three resistances been of the same order, roughly, all the capacitances would have been of the same order, then this approximation probably wouldn't have been valid. Okay. Because if you have a dominant term, you can neglect others, you can say, okay, fine. I'll imagine that this is a first order circuit equivalent to I can neglect the capacitance of the other nodes and those. 
Okay, so that's what we are going to do for all all the circuits that that we that we see. Okay, fine. So now we have a we have a, a capacitance or we have a way of associating poles with our differential amplifier. Now, if you recall, our differential amplifier model was effectively this, right? <laughs> where this GM was GM of the M1, and this RO was RDS4 parallel RDS2, right? So this was the differential amplifier model. So how do I edit this model to, 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 uh, to plug in that capacitance? Why should I add the capacitance to ensure that this differential amplifier model is the same as this? So I have a capacitance here. So where should I add the capacitance in that abstract view? Right, exactly, right? So I can add it here, C1. Okay, fine, cool. So now we put our put this guy in a negative feedback loop. V naught, and all we have to do is to evaluate the loop gain. Okay, so let's go ahead and evaluate the loop gain. So again, tell me what should I do to evaluate loop gain? First thing that what you should do is desensitize the input because input doesn't have a role to play in figuring out loop gain. So it's a property of the loop. Next thing, I break the loop and I conveniently you can break the loop at a place where there is no loading, which is which is here because I'm not drawing any current here. So breaking the loop will not make any any difference, right? So I will break the loop here and apply an input in the direction of the signal flow. And this is V return. So what will be V return over V test? So this voltage will be, so again, this current in this direction will be GM times V test. This current flows into a parallel combination of these two arcs and that capacitance, right? So the voltage that we will accrue at V naught will be minus GM times V test over SC1 plus the conductances that is G naught plus G by K. Okay, so, so V return is V naught over K, so which in this case becomes minus GM over K by times V test, so C1 plus G naught plus G over K. And so essentially I write it in the format of, so L of S becomes negative of V return over V test. So I'll write it in the form of DC gain divided by poles. So this becomes minus GM over K by G naught by G by K times one by one plus S by P1, where P1 is G naught plus G over K by C1. Okay, so this is basically a simple algebra, but the key thing to note here is, key thing to note here is, the DC gain is this, that is mod of L of S, sorry, there should not be any negative because I'm doing L of S, right? So, so DC gain is GM over K 
by G naught by G plus K. So note that if, if G were zero, right? If G were zero, that is, this would have been open circuit, right? This would have been open circuit. Then the gain would have been, I mean, or rather I should say, uh, this R, KR would have been much larger than R naught. Then essentially we would have been able to neglect the loading of KR. So in that case, in this equation, this G would have been zero and your DC gain would have been, DC gain of the loop would have been GM over G naught by K, right? So, but you have the loading effect. So that's why you have the DC gain, which is slightly lower, right? Slightly or more depends on, on the values of, of, uh, uh, of G. So this is here and then you will hit P1 and after that it will roll off. Okay, fine. So this roll off frequency will be what? I mean, rather this unity gain frequency will be what? Can you quickly tell me, making those approximations, what will be this unity gain frequency? You can look at, uh, look at the expression and tell me. We are dealing with frequencies much greater than P1. We are dealing with frequencies much greater than P1. What will be the approximation? So what is the equation of this line? This is GM over K by G naught by G over K times one plus S by P1 will essentially become S by P1. So essentially P1 by S, P1 by S means G naught plus G over K by S. So this goes, so GM over KS. So essentially this omega U is GM over K. Okay, so note that omega u does not depend on the loading effect, right? Looks like omega u depends on gm and not on not on g, and that should make sense because at relatively high frequencies, right? When you are talking about omega u, we are talking about non DC frequencies, much higher frequencies than than the pole frequencies. In those frequencies, all the current or rather the impedance provided by the capacitance will dominate. Right, the impedance provided by the capacitance will dominate and not the R. So all the current will choose to flow into the capacitance, or rather, bulk of the current will choose to flow into the capacitance. At DC, the most of the current will choose to flow into the resistance. So that's why you get the DC gain. At high frequency, most of the current is going to flow into the capacitance. That's why you're going to get a roll off. Right, capacitance increases the the, 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 the impedance of the capacitance decreases with frequency. So hence, the voltage that F use also goes down. As, as you increase the frequency. So if most of the current is used to flow into the capacitance, the voltage that is going to level up at G0 will be Gm times Gks over C1, right? Approximately, independent of R. So if the voltage at, uh, at G0 becomes negative of Gm times Gm over C1 times Gks, then the, obviously the field return will be one over K of that. So naturally the loop gain expression at high frequency becomes Gm over k, independent of r. Okay, so that's the intuition behind why the unity going frequency expression is so simple. Okay. Ah, okay, correct, correct, right. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, fine. So now, this might seem that we have solved the issue as long as as long as this is much greater than one, right? Then we should have a clean settling, uh, sorry, we should have an accurate settling, right? Low, low steady state error. And as long as omega u is much higher frequency than, I mean, it's quite hard to get it to whatever you want, then it will have a fast settling also, right? Because omega u transfers to time constant. But there is an issue, there is always an issue. So, so the issue is, Sometimes you have to drive a very uh, low impedance lo load. When I say low impedance load, I essentially mean a very small value of resistance. resistance. And that value of the resistance is not necessarily in your control. It's something that is given. For example, if I use a microphone, the output of the audio amplifier will be probably order of 10 ohms, 20 ohms, 5 ohms. And if the GMs are of the order of few millisiemens, under the assumption that you can only burn so much current, then let's say 10 millisieverts times 5 ohms is gain of 50 milli, right? So that is 
hardly anything. You are not even reaching one. So what you need to do then is to find out ways of increasing the DC gain. Now one might say I can increase the DC gain by making bigger and bigger differential amplifiers. That is possible. But the issue is this. So, so let's say the requirement is this. So this is a requirement we need. So let's say requirement is need high DC gain while driving low RL. Okay. So, so let's say, so this is our differential amplifier. And I connect an RL here. So I'm not putting the capacitance now because we're talking about DC gain. So the DC gain in this case will be GM times RL, right? So this is B naught. So now if RL is very low, then what you need to do is to keep on increasing GM. And the handles that we have in increasing GMs are increase current, increase W by E, or both. As it turns out, if you keep on doing that, you have to want so much current that this is, I mean, the design itself will become infeasible and you will run out of battery very quickly. So then we need to do something in order to prevent this drop of gain when you have to drive a low impedance node. Okay. So, so if one stage does not give you enough, I mean, so by the way, I can put cash code and everything inside this uh, differential amplifier. But it won't help because cash coding something does not increase GM. It only increases output resistance, right? So if I, so we have learned multiple techniques of increasing the output resistance of of uh, uh, of an amplifier, but those techniques will fail because ultimately it your output resistance will be dominated by the load resistance, right? So whatever techniques we have learned for increasing the output resistance of an amplifier. All are going to be nullified because the design our designer is asking you to uh, is giving you a low impedance load. Okay, so then you have to then step back for a second and think about what should we do in order to figure out how can I drive a low impedance load. Now there are multiple solutions. One obvious solution is if the reason the gain is dropping is because we are allowing the lo low impedance load. To, to drop the gain of, of the GM, right? So the low impedance load is directly connected to the output of the GM, which is, in, which is essentially uh, pushing the gain down. So then if we can think of a scenario where the low impedance load is not connected to the, out of, uh, not connected to the output of the GM directly, then it should be good, right? So what is the, th what is the low, uh, can you imagine, a, can you think of a state which can drive uh, low impedance load without too much drop of gain. So let me rephrase the question. One of the reasons this, this load is getting, this uh, connecting this load uh, is causing a problem because the GM is essentially the voltage control current source, right? The output impedance of the GM is very high, but connecting the load, a small load at the output impedance of a GM is going to kill the gain. So what contraption can I put between RL and the GM so that it, that contraption will be able to drive RL? Among the four control sources that you have studied, what do you think you should put? So essentially what I'm asking is this, so connecting RL directly is a problem. So I don't want to connect RL directly. I want to put something here and then connect. What do you expect the input impedance to be of this block, whatever you connect? Among zero and infinity, can you tell me? These are the two options. If I have this to be a low impedance, then all the if I have the low impedance, then equivalent impedance will be low, right? So, and you are, I think the reason you are saying you should be low impedance is because 
if if i if i push in a low impedance then this all the current will flow from the outside and what about this side what what about uh, uh, what do you expect the impedance to be from the output side high or low zero or infinity ultimately i'm driving a low low resistive load It should be as low as possible. So basically, whatever you connect, it should behave like a battery almost, right? So there are two solutions possible. That's why one is, I, I mean, one one solution is obvious. This is not negotiable. This output impedance has to be quite low, right? So this has to be ideally should be zero, right? But there are two solutions possible. One is looking in the inside. This can be this impedance R in can tend to zero or R in can tend to infinity. Either way, the solution is possible. If it's R in the tending to zero, then essentially what I am, okay, so let me rephrase. If R in is tending to zero, I'm able to push all the current inside this block, but the current that is going to come out, the current that is going to come out will essentially be the same current, right? Or a fraction of that current. But that current is going to flow into RL, but that will not give me a gain. Right? Because I would have gotten the same gain if I had connected RL directly to the input. Isn't it? So that current times RL was not giving me enough gain. So pushing a, I mean, having R into me tending to zero will not solve that problem. Because that current is anyway going to flow in and that current is going to come out. And you are essentially going to get the same, same result. Right? So even though it looks like it, it is possible, that will be an issue. So what about this case of R in tends to infinity? If R in tends to infinity and R out tends to zero, so and let's say this gives you a voltage gain of one, approximately one, right? So will that suffice? In this case, it will suffice because this guy is going to give you a lot of gain. The first guy is going to give you a lot of gain because you are not loading. Right? So a differential amplifier which is not loaded with a small load is going to give you a lot of gain anyhow. So now, and if this guy, second stage gives you a gain of, gain of one approximately, or even slightly less than one, while driving a low impedance load, then the gain at this stage is getting translated to the gain at the output stage also. Right? So now the question is, what type of configuration that you know of, which can give you a gain of approximately one, while driving a variable load RL is very low. You have options between common source, common rain, common gate. These are the right? Yeah. Which one will you choose? Common rain, right? So let's do common rain then. So we'll do common rain. So common rain becomes this. Right. So again, the, uh, connecting it like this may or may not be possible because RL might not be available with both the, uh, uh, I mean, for, RL might not be a explicit resistance. So in that case, we, we know what to do. We, we couple the output with an AC, with, a, with AC coupling capacitance. However, we need to bias this transistor. Let me call this M, M6. For the M7, I bias it using using a current source. Okay, but this also doesn't close the picture. Ultimately, we wanted to have this K minus one R K R, right? So we have to put the same thing here. Connect this. This. Okay, so, so now if I have to figure out the loop gain of this guy, so again, now you have capacitance here, and there will be capacitance associated with this node also. And let's say call this C tends to infinity, so that for AC responses, I don't have to bother. So let me redraw this, redraw this with, with after removing all the bias equivalence.
So I need to figure out what is the what is the loop gain of this loop. We do the same old, same old. Break the loop, apply V test. This voltage here is. gm over g01 plus sc1 times v test negative of that what about v0 we call this v01 so in terms of v01 what will be v0 approximately assume gm of m7 gm7 times kr is much greater than 1 in a common drain amplifier it's this this assumption is valid. What is the gain between V naught one and V naught? Approximately. Okay, let me ask you this. What is the gain between V i and V naught? What is the expression? This expression is G M R by one plus GMR. So if GMR is much greater than one, then it is approximately one, right? So this is under the condition that GMR is much greater than one. If you are not able to make much, much greater than one, that's also fine. It will be some fraction, maybe 0.8, maybe 0 0.7, maybe 0 0.9, something, some fraction will be there. So, so this V naught becomes approximately equal to V naught one. And we have a capacitance associated with this node, C2. But do you think the pole associated with the capacitance C2 will be a will be a low frequency pole or a high frequency pole? When I say low frequency pole, what I actually mean is is the resistors associated with that node of the order of R0 or of the order of 1 over C. So when analog circuit designer asks low frequency, I mean high impedance or low impedance, essentially we are asking whether it is of the order of one over RGM or of the order of one, or higher or lower than that, right? So what is the pole? What is the resistance associated with that node? V not under this open circuit. Uh, when I am trying to evaluate the loop gain, One over gain, right? Because we are going to find sort that VK so that the first stage kind of goes out of the picture, doesn't play, play a role. So you are looking at at the output this side, you are looking at two current splits. One is towards the bottom, which is KR, and looking on the top, which is one over G. It's the order of one over G. So essentially we see that we have one low frequency pole, which is at the intermediate stage, and one high frequency pole, and we neglect the high frequency pole. Right, so essentially, it still depends the first order kind of circuit. You still will have approximately 20 dB per decade roll off, and you are able to cushion, you are able to shield the output resistance by putting a current buffer, voltage buffer inside. Right, so this was one of the very popular structures for making voltage regulators once upon a time uh, because of these properties. But this has become kind of out of date. The reason is something to do with the biasing picture. So now if I go back and look at the biasing picture, this is VDD. So GM is also operating with a voltage supply of VDD, right? So all of them are operating with the same voltage supply. So let's say assume VDD is of the order of one volt. I'll wait, yeah, let's say this out order, order of one volt, which is not very uncommon nowadays. Uh, so can you tell me this voltage? What is the maximum this voltage can rise? So this voltage is nothing but a differential amplifier, right? So this is the V naught. So what is the maximum that V naught can go up to? Assuming that VDD and everything is connected. Why is giving transistors in saturation? Can it go up to VDD? Can we not go up to VDD? VDD is kind of the top, right? Just like 
A normal differential amplifier VDD is connected to the top, so VDD will be connected there. So can V not go up to VDD? If V not goes up to VDD, will M4 remain in saturation? VDS will be zero. If v VDS or VLC of the transistor becomes zero, then it's not in saturation. So we need to keep at least one overdrive voltage drop. Uh, um, we need to have one overdrive voltage margin between the drain and the source, right? So the V naught will be at max going to one V overdrive closer to VDD. Okay. So, so which essentially means this can go to VDD. So one volt minus V overdrive. So one volt minus V overdrive maximum, right? If you are comfortable, just in one volt. Let's assume view overdrive is zero, right? For the ease of calculation. What about M7? What about the uh, source of M7? Here you are talking about a PGS drop between between that node that is the gate of M7 to the source of M7. That you need to have. There is no choice. So when you have a PGS, you essentially have a threshold voltage plus overdrive. If the threshold voltage is of the order of 300, 400 millivolt, and you have overdrive of 100 millivolt. So essentially, you are having a drop of 500 millivolt here. So this voltage can rise at the max 400 millivolt. Right? This is max. There is no other way, right? So it cannot go higher than 400 millivolt. So if you are running with a one volt supply, and the maximum output voltage is 400 millivolt, then you essentially you are losing 600 millivolt just for biasing. So 60% of the supply voltage is gone because you are unable to buy. This was not a problem when people were using five volt supply because this would have still be of the order of 400 millivolt or 500 millivolt. In that case, only 10% of the loss you are getting. In this case, 60% loss of the group just for bias. Even though this is a very beautiful architecture, so this is one out of date because of this reason. It is still used in some cases where you, have, you still can use high voltages, right? But in most low voltage applications, it is no longer used. So the solution to that is, is then people said, so by the way, this is the second state is often that's why called an output driver, right? So we it, it's, it's, it's easy to drive a low impedance load using a common drain state, which is often called the output driver. So using this low impedance output driver has kind of gotten out of date because of the reasons that I just mentioned. So the only architecture, right, which kind of gives me relatively high swing with variable gain, I agree, is the common source stage, right? A relatively high, I mean, in a common source stage, a simple common source amplifier, the output can move to almost one overdrive voltage closer to to, uh, to your out, uh, 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 one over voltage closer to VDD or ground, right? So if this is not able to, if this is causing a problem, then we can we can think of putting a common source state at the second stage. Uh, granted, there will be a issue of loading, but when you don't have any solution, but you still have this want to have decent gain, then we will stick to that. Okay. So essentially, what I'm looking at here is I can put a common source stage. So I can put either an NMOS common source or a PMOS common source here. So I'll start off with the PMOS common source, common source. And we have this. So let me dis disregard this K minus one R for the time being. And try to find out whether this indeed helps. So this guy goes to VDD minus V overdrive. What is the, so by the way, can this guy go to VDD minus V overdrive now? So what happens if this voltage goes to VDD over V overdrive? What happens to this transistor M7? Should be cut off. It can be cut off, right? So, I think threshold voltage is higher than overdrive, then you don't have enough VLC for the transistor. 
So that can become cut off. However, this is not a problem because this need not go to VDD over V overdrive, VDD minus V overdrive. So this is the maximum this the, the GM can go to, right? But I need not operate at the maximum, right? It can go below. So if it goes below, we are good, right? So this, so the output need not go to VDD over V overdrive. Output in this case needs to be going to VDD minus VSG of M7. Which is not a problem because this constant is set by M7. But the GM, the first is GM can anyways be designed to, to spin to this level. I'm, I'm relaxing the condition for GM. So this is not an issue. But now let's turn our focus to what's happening to the drain of M7, right? What is the maximum that the drain of M7 can go to? When I say maximum, what is the maximum voltage that a drain of N7 can go to? Comments? Can it go all the way to VDD? No. So what is the maximum it can go to? It can go to one threshold voltage above this voltage, right? Right? It can go to VDD minus VGS7 plus threshold voltage of the of the PMOS transistor. Right? So this is effectively equal to VDD minus V overdrive of the order of. So you see that putting a uh, putting a common source in second stage helps us in increasing the possible output voltage, the maximum possible output voltage. Right? So that is why this type of stages are, are very useful. Now, you might argue that by putting an RL, I am killing the gain. But that's okay because I am not killing the gain of the first stage. It's a product of two gains. Right? So as long as I design EM of S7 to be of the order of EM times RL is maybe one or maybe approximately closer to one. Then also it's good because I am getting bulk of the gain from the first stage. If the gain of the first stage is 40 dB and the gain of the second stage is 0 dB, I am still getting an overall gain of 40 dB. Right? So that way, uh, I'm still able to get a decent amount of gain while driving a uh, low impedance node. Right? So before we finish, before we stop here, so one last comment. So let's say I have a capacitance associated with this node also. Not let's say we'll have a capacitance associated with this node. Now, if I, this case, because it can give you a large gain, right? it's often used to make relatively large gain amplifiers also, even if you are not trying to drive an RF. Okay, sometimes you require a gain of a million or 10 million. In that case, whatever you do, a single stage will not be able to give you that gain. So then in those cases, you cascade multiple of these gains. If one stage gives you 40 dB, two stage or second stage also gives you 40 dB, both the stage can be combined and into 80 dB. Right? So, so that's good. That can be done. But in that case, there is an issue. The issue is has to do with the capacitance. So what if this is the scenario? Now, can you comment on the output impedance of this node? It is of the order of 1 over GM or, or not? Only the second stage. Forget about the first stage. Let's say the first stage is not there. Why do you say 1 over GM? I'm looking into the drain of M7 now. Right? This I'm looking to the drain of M7 is the order of R0, right? So this is of the order of R0-7. Here the output impedance is also of the order of R0, right? So we have two output impedances, two high impedance nodes. And we have capacitances attached to it, which means I have two poles which are, which are close by, right? Two low frequency poles which are close by, which means in our loop gain, we are going to have 40 dB dollar, right? Around omega u, which is a problem, right? So you kind of try to hit large, large gain by putting multiple sensors in gas for, you can get a stability in a closed loop system, right? So in tomorrow's class, 
in the last class we will we will uh, conclude the course and we'll also see some ways of dealing with this issue okay okay thank you